OK, we're now going to have a panel. It's the first and only panel of the main stage session, so yes. It's an important topic. It's a topic on women, and is it getting better? So most of you in the audience know that it's not easy being a woman in tech. We have a perception of what it means to be successful, and women are not the first people that come to mind. In 2021, of the $330 billion invested in venture capital, only 2% went to women-founded companies. 16% of funding, though, went to mixed gender companies. So while the woman-only number was lower than prior years, the number of mixed gender teams has been going up since 2010, which is great. And women today are at the helm of unicorns and are taking companies public. Every woman that starts a company is a trailblazer, including the three women I'm about to introduce and the few women that I see in the audience, all of which is great. So today we have three women, Nikki, who I'll bring up first, who started Homebound after the wildfires of Napa, and she is in the business of building a custom home for people transparently, simply, and with a human touch. They have raised over $200 million since 2018, and she was an early executive at Thumbtack and is a serial remodeler and DIY aficionado. She also has the dubious honor of having a sister in the audience who is here in her own right. So please welcome Nikki. <laughs> Raquel started Wabi, an AI company building the next generation of self-driving technology. You saw her on the opening video. She was most recently at Uber as the head of R&D for the ATG Group. She's a professor of computer science at the University of Toronto, grew up in Spain, and raised an $83.5 million Series A that Coastal Ventures led. And that's Raquel. <laughs> and finally, we have Celine, and she's the founder of Loyal, a company developing ways for longevity in dogs. You saw her in the video, too, which could also potentially help humans. She's raised $15 million to work on this challenge with early trials. She studied neuroscience and gene therapeutics and worked with Laura Deming, who you're going to see right after this session. So with that, I'm going to go into the questions. And if we have time, we'll take some audience Q&A as well. So welcome, and thanks for being here. Thank you uh, for having us. Nikki and I are rocking in the jumpsuits, in case you guys didn't <laughs> notice. Uh, so first, let me start with the question of fundraising, given the current markets. We have seen a 20% downtick in venture funding in Q1. We had a session on it yesterday, and it looks like it could get worse. Do you think this impacts women more than it has, or have we passed that point? Nikki, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I think what we've seen throughout the pandemic is that women have been disproportionately impacted by reductions in capital. And I think that's something that we probably will expect to see. Um, I think the bright side of it is there are opportunities for every company that's out there to be thinking about adding to their team, um, whether it's a founding team, including a female founder, or whether it's an existing company hiring a really badass woman on their team um, to help them differentiate and grow, both winning talent wars, but also going out and trying to find opportunities to get funding, um, to get press, to get other things that having a woman on the team can be really differentiating in. And you did a fair amount of that when you were Thumbtack, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I had the incredible honor of getting to be an early executive at Thumbtack, which is the largest and fastest growing local services marketplace. I got to join, um, I spent almost a decade at Bain after business school and got to join Thumbtack when we were about 65 people and be an early exec there, which is where I really cut my teeth on what is this tech thing. And the thing that was really special about it was getting to be not only an early executive team member, but a woman, um, I had a baby while I was there, which was you know, the first executive to take mat leave, um, and really got to be, in many ways, the right hand to our awesome CEO, Marco. Um, and there were a lot of things that Silicon Valley is simply not interested in featuring a white man in press or in featuring a white man in speaking panels. And so um, I, I got to do something that I think we've seen lots of much more famous women like Sheryl Sandberg do, which is step in and play a role that just didn't exist at the company. So I got to do things like go on the Today Show, which was like the single most valuable piece of media we ever got. I got to do it over and over again for free for the company. Um, and so I think there are tons of opportunities to create. Again, it's I, I think of it as press. I think of it as 
recruiting half of the world's population. You have an unfair advantage in attracting really incredible women to the team. Um, and I think it's also just a different perspective. Um, Ben Horitz yesterday was talking about how there was an entire team of women and the characteristic that those women embodied that nobody else seemed to embody was helpfulness. And that was so essential to the company and to the mission of what Andreessen was trying to do. And I think that's something that's really important. Women bring a different perspective and it's really valuable to add that to your team. Raquel, what about your fundraising process? You come from a very steep AI background. Yeah, so I would say that, um, you know, my experience with fundraise, I only, I guess, uh, fundraised once. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, um, it was, I would say, a very interesting, exciting experience. Um, um, I don't think, uh, you know, I saw uh, anything there that was, you know, was more difficult for me because I was a woman. Um, that being said, you know, I had already, you know, a big career behind me. Uh, now, I think that, you know, the numbers don't lie, right? So I think it's, it's harder, uh, you know, for, yes, uh, you know, minorities to actually fundraise. Uh, but I think there is a lot of, you know, uh, exciting efforts out there in order to uh, make sure that, you know, we are making change, that things are, are going towards the, you know, towards the best. Um, and, you know, in difficult moments, uh, you know, it's always the case that uh, minorities suffer more. Uh, so we just need to be more conscious, so, you know, all of us in terms of, you know, trying to help out our peers so that that's not the case. Celine, any perspectives? Yeah, I mean, maybe something that's pertinent to the group here is a lot of us are working on weird things, and weird things are important. They push forward um, society, and you know, dog longevity definitely fits pretty squarely into weird. Um, and I, I actually have a lot of optimism. I, I raised my first round about two years ago, five million dollars, just literally just me, and a really super unesthetic deck, and that was it. Um, and the fact that I was able to do that, I think, it was actually a testament to the fact that things were changing, that people could see uh, somebody who, uh, you know, retrospectively looking on it, like had very little context for literally anything, except for some you know, aging biology, um, could go and like turn into the person that could build a multi-billion dollar business. And that's hopefully being at least like more data points in the like maybe was you know, the correct bet. We'll, we'll obviously like see as the story plays out. Um, and go back to your original question about what's gonna change with the recession, I mean, this is um, my first one in this seat, obviously, but I think one thing I've noticed in general is that um, one thing that was important for me was to learn about what are the patterns that people fit to um, when they're considering investing in somebody, joining somebody, even just deciding if somebody like, is competent or intelligent. And a lot of things that I learned my first three years in the Valley was learning these patterns and fitting to them. Um, and it was a bit of a personal journey of figuring out who I am personally and also figuring out who I needed to be to get done what I need to get done to build, you know, hopefully some of the first aging drugs. Um, and I hope it doesn't, you know, I hope it doesn't regress, but I would say it would be, I would be unsurprised if we don't see some regression into um, uh, old, old patterns that are, you know, definitely made a lot of people a lot of money, but are not um, maybe well-trained. Good point. When we were talking, you had this really interesting funding story that involved a person sitting in this room right now. Do you want to share that story? Sure. Um, so I left Thumbtack after four years of building that company, and Marco was the person who really nudged me. I was talking to all these other companies about joining as an executive, and he was like, you're a founder. Just go found something. And that moment was actually really, really pivotal in deciding that I would found something. Having someone who I saw as an incredible founder who I trusted, who knew me really well, um, was sort of the push I needed to make that happen. And so I was pregnant with my third child. It seemed like a terrible time to found a company, but maybe it always is. And so got started building Homebound, and we needed to go out and raise a Series A. And so I was 38 weeks pregnant, um, traipsing all all over Silicon Valley, and I'm not a very big person normally, but I'm enormous when I'm pregnant. Um, and the thing that was really interesting for me, I, I went into it thinking, why would anyone give me money? Like, that just doesn't even make any sense. Obviously, I'm going to have a baby. What am I going to do? It's probably not a good time to start a company. I did not experience one shred of what felt like bias anywhere. Um, there were some awkward meetings where I'd be in a room full of men, and just nobody would say anything about the fact that I was visibly pregnant. Uh, and so I'd bring it up and talk to people about my plan, which ended up being mostly to 
take my baby everywhere for some period of time, which turned out to work out great for the company. Um, but in that process, um, we ended up raising a $16 million Series A. Um, Thrive led it, uh, but Kosla participated. And I had gone through, at the time, um, Keith Ravoy, and then I spent a bunch of time with David Wyden, and then the final meeting was, okay, you have to meet Vinod. And so, as with my co-founder, meeting with Vinod in their office in Menlo Park, I was 38 weeks pregnant, and the baby was sitting on a nerve, and I couldn't see out of one eye, and I was having contractions. So I was with my co-founder, who does not have any kids, and I was like, all right, if I get up and leave, it's just because I'm going into labor. And actually, my sister is sitting in the audience. She's joining Kosla, and she, I called her, and I was like, I'm going to be right by your house, and I might have an emergency, so just know that this is happening. But no, it actually, I think, doesn't know this. We had a great meeting, uh, <laughs> and Kosla has now invested in our series A, B, and C. Uh, but it was a really funny experience and sort of an exaggerated view of, like, I'm a woman. I'm a mom. This is my third kid. Um, and... In retrospect, I got to go back and talk to a number of people who invested and say, like, why did you invest in me then? Um, and the answer I got was, well, you're fundraising and launching a company while you're pregnant. It indicates that you might be pretty fierce. And so that felt like a good indicator. <laughs> It's a great story. <laughs> Did you go into contractions right after? And I actually went straight to the hospital from that. We got the contractions settled down, and I didn't deliver the baby for two more days, but <laughs> just in time. We signed the term sheet the day I got home from the hospital, closed the round 30 days later, launched our second market in the midst of that with a brand new baby down in Southern California with us. It was, it was chaotic, but my daughter's great, and she will be an entrepreneur someday. There you go. <laughs> Um, Celine, you come from a sciences background, and there are definitely more women founders in the life sciences. You write passionately about your experience being a young solo female founder on a blog. If any of you guys haven't read it, just go to Loyal. Celine writes beautifully there. Uh, you've often talked about being compared to Elizabeth Holmes. <laughs> Tell us whether that's a challenge or an opportunity, and how do you address it? Yeah, um, my so I used to get so angry. I used to get so mad. I like. I remember when I was raising my Series A, which uh, Coastal also led, and to be clear, Coastal did not do this, um, but a couple of other firms I've talked to did, where it was just like so obvious that they were, um, I would walk in and it was clear they weren't seeing me as incredibly competent. There, there are things that we, we've achieved that have been, you know, the, the aging field has bitched about, sorry, complained about uh, <laughs> for a while. It's okay after Jim Messina yesterday, you can do whatever you want. Thanks, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Um, and I, I used to get so mad. I remember I like, called one of the partners. I was like, what the, you know, do you understand this dynamic? In, in retrospect, like, n you know, uh, not a battle, not a hill to die on. Um, and I think the thing that I've learned in general is the importance of just kind of being okay with it, I guess. I mean, maybe this isn't the lesson to give, but it's the lesson I gave. I realized, like, okay, these are the things that, you know, I walk in, here are the, you know, precedents somebody's going to have. Like, I'm definitely going to get an Elizabeth Holmes comment. And even if it's not about me, right, maybe it's about the fact that this fund or this individual is insecure, that they don't know how to diligence whether, I mean, can you actually send a dog's lifespan? Like, I don't know. They're not experts in it. Um, and they're worried about being embarrassed. They're worried about, you know, making themselves or looking bad to a GP or whatever it is. And so I've just gotten really good at trying to predict whatever I think that person is going to be concerned about and just putting in um, reassuring phrases that basically in, that negate that bias or that worry before the conversation, before it even, you know, is becomes a fully formed thought in their head. So like was the Lowe's home co concern, you know, we do a lot of our research with third party CROs. Like we literally cannot pay our CROs enough to uh, forge data for us. We are a very, very, very tiny portion of Can their revenue. What CRO is? Yeah, sorry. Um, so there's kind of two ways of doing research. One is, you know, you'll have laboratories in house, think like, you know, white coats, pipetting colored fluids, whatever. And like, that's what the actual company does. Um, a lot of life sciences companies will actually uh, pay third parties to do the physical research for them. It's just a lower capital cost way to do some of the same research. Um, so we do a lot of our work that way. And so I'll always, I learned to just, you know, throw this in or throw, you know, whatever se other sentence in that like, you know, quietly reassured whatever worry that person would have. And I think one of the things I learned in this in general is like, yeah, you can be, you know, annoyed, frustrated, whatever, but it, it, in the end, it's actually just important. The most, like the most impactful thing any of us can do is be successful. 
right? Like that's how you change the pattern. That's how you get people not thinking on these, you know, bad patterns. And I can, you know, ring my whatever as long as possible, but that won't change until until that's occurred. And so I really now nucleate on that. It's actually been a much more zen way to approach the many many kind of daggers you get at yourself when you're building like that, like the Elizabeth Holmes comments. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Raquel, we were talking earlier about building diverse teams. I remember when your series A deck and we were talking about it and VCs basically went, oh yeah, I'm just going to invest in it because it's Raquel, which is great and huge testimony to you. But you also pushed back a whole lot to say, hey, look, I want to build a diverse team and let me explain what that is. Tell us a little bit about how you think about that and how your executive team looks right now because you're a very deep AI company. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I really deeply care about diversity, and I think that if you're, um, it seems to be a bird that has a question. Um, <laughs> if <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, right. you're, you're trying to solve something as complicated as self-driving, uh, um, it's very important that you know it's a problem that hasn't been solved, right? So, the solution doesn't exist yet, um, and the best way to go around, you know, trying to find a solution is to try to look at it from many different perspectives, right? And if everybody is a white dude, bro, that, you know, f you know feels and, you know, and is going to the same school, that is thinking the same way, it's very, very hard to, uh, you know, solve such a difficult problem. Um, so, you know, it's important that you be bring that diversity, and diversity is not just gender, right? It's many, many other types of diversity. So, and there's a lot of studies out there that shows that diverse teams actually outperform, uh, you know, other teams. Um, so definitely something I care about. Um, I guess we have uh, two C-suites at, uh, at Wabi, so myself as well as uh, Vivian Sun, who is our chief commercial officer. Um, and I didn't pick her because she was a woman. It turns out to be, you know, the best out there in the market. And, uh, you know, it's fantastic to see that indeed uh, it turns out that she's a woman. Uh, but I do believe uh, that, you know, is, uh, you know, on all of us to actually bring those diverse teams and make sure that they actually thrive. Oftentimes, uh, you know, diverse people or, you know, tend to uh, overclay or underclaim much more than other, uh, other folks, right? Um, and they tend to need to do, you know, 10 times more, like in case of women, right, in order to be recognized for what they do. Uh, we tend to be very, very shy, very, very humble. This is something I learned on my first two pitches that, Raquel, this is not the time to be humble. Like, what are you doing with your life, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, change and, you know, yes, you know, talk about it, although, you know, you, you don't like it, right? Um, so I think that is, you know, in, in all of us to make sure that, you know, we understand, you know, who is performing well in our teams. We help them perform better. We help them raise, uh, you know, through the ranks. And it's not about just yes, hiring people. Typically, oftentimes, companies stop there. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I hire so many women. Uh, but what happened with them? Like, uh, did you promote them? Are they having leadership opportunities? Um, so, you know, make sure that you pay, you know, attention to it. And, you know, oftentimes as women, we talk about, you know, when we do something, we say we. Uh, when it's a man, we'll say I, right? So, uh, and as a consequence, when it comes performance, you know, performance time, you know, it looks like they have done much more than us, right? Um, so there is a whole bunch of things like this that you should be very, very careful that you actually look uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen, right? And it's, it's really all of us, you know, allies are the most important thing, you know, in diversity. Yeah, Sarah Pryor brought this up yesterday that women tend to be a, tend to want to be perfect before they talk about it. Men tend to want to be eh, kind of okay, and they'll kind of talk their way through it. And there's been studies showing that. How did each of you kind of get over that hump uh, to basically say, okay, it's my company, I'm fundraising, uh, it's my baby, it's going to be big, I'm not going to be so humble. Anyone want to take a shot at it? I mean, I can talk about how I I. I, so I struggled with this a lot because I, I, I again, I had spent a lot of time um, b before I started Loyal just trying to think about and understand, again, the, the patterns. Um, for context, I didn't grow up like at all with any context to business or anything, so I was kind of like a spring chicken when I showed up. Um, ask Laura for some funny stories about me. <laughs> um, and one of the things I really struggled with was finding the right, because it's really an art and a dance. And if you are too confident, you get labeled as as cocky. Um, and I remember when I first raced my seed round, I heard that this very famous venture capitalist, um, he was like, oh, I know Celine, she's super cocky. And that broke my heart. Like it totally broke my heart as a, a you know, it's going out for my first fundraise because it, 
I, I deep inside, actually, I wasn't at all, right? I, I sometimes like still struggle with that, honestly. But I was just trying to figure out what was the line of, you know, I'm not gonna, you, you, and you know, anybody who has raised something deep technical, you don't go and like laundry list. Well, here every single, re you have to tell a story, right? And you're cognizant of the the risk, and you are transparent about the risk, but you also are telling a story and a vision of the future, and you have to balance that with the uh, the humbleness. But it's just. It, if, again, if the pattern isn't trained on you and how you communicate it, you're invariably gonna get it wrong as you're learning it. So maybe that would be my, yeah, I think my big, my biggest point would be like, when you see these mistakes in women, it's often because they're trying to fit something that's just like not, not natural. Right. Raquel? Um, let's see, what was the question again? How did you kind of get over not being humble and kind of talking a little bit more about yourself? It's like humility and hubris, and it's kind of like where do you fall on the spectrum, and women fall a lot over here. But for any of you guys to do what you're doing, which is tremendous, you got to move up. Yeah, so for me it was, um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I had prior to, um, I guess, funding Wabi, I had a very successful career in academia. And, and then, you know, in, I guess, industry and in research, uh, right? So it was in a moment in time, it's like, I got this, right? Yeah, you know, life is good. Um, and then, you know, I decided that, you know, I was going to do something different. I was going to find, uh, you know, a new company. Um, and then suddenly I had a gigantic imposter syndrome. And it was very interesting because, you know, I give a lot of speeches about how we should never, have, you know, we should overcome our imposter syndrome and, you know, uh, we are capable of doing this and whatnot. And then I realized, like, this is happening to me now, you know, after, you know, 25 years, like, what's, what's happening? Um, and, you know, for me, what was important is to see, you know, to think about why I'm doing this, right? I'm doing this because, you know, I exited my case from yep. Uber with my team. So I have, um, you know, um, I have uh, an incredible team behind, and, and this was about, you know, okay, I need to fundraise because, you know, we are doing this because we're going to transform the world, right? So you need to get over your shit, right? And you just move forward. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that was basically is what, uh, you know, I, I talk a lot to myself. I don't know, maybe I'm a bit crazy, but uh, um, I think yeah, that... You're <laughs> definitely not crazy. I think, I think that helps, right? And, and it was about, okay, you, you know, just demonstrate what you have done, what, you know, what your plans are, and why this is, you know, the thing ever and that that actually helps so we close our you know series a uh, i guess uh thanks be not uh you know over 80 million dollars right it was very bold i only have a powerpoint try right, and a team uh but um you know yes yes go over it and you know every day was hard afterwards right but uh, you know yes yes keep going and now it's gone so let's that's great um, I'm going to ask you a question and have you answer it first uh because we were talking about it uh, Women do a lot with the media, but I do find that the media in America will either make women the greatest thing, like they're the next Elizabeth Holmes, or they will just basically be a lot of takedown stories. And we've seen a lot, particularly in the consumer internet space. You're really good with media, Nikki. All of you are. Uh, we were talking about this at dinner last night. What do you think is happening there, and how do women kind of cope with that? Yeah, I mean, I think the incredible benefit of the media is you can build an amazing brand for your company and you can reach people that you would never reach before in a really credible way. And I think most male founders, and actually I'd say pretty much all founders, start working on press too late. Um, that's something I saw at Thumbtack. We did literally zero press for eight years, and it's really hard to start after eight years and do anything. Um, and so I think it's super powerful, but it's all consumerism and they want sensational stories about how incredible you are or sensational stories about how you are the worst thing ever. And so I very much think when you sign up for the big stories about how great you are, you have to be sort of prepared for takedown stories. And I think, unfortunately, there are disproportionately large numbers of takedown stories about female CEOs, um, which I think sucks a ton for lots of reasons. But I also think it's just a reality. And so um, early on, I have Emil Michael from Uber on my board, who's been an incredible supporter of me from the very beginning. And and early, early on, he said, you just need to get a really thick skin because there will be a takedown story because you are going to be successful. Um, and I have a really good PR firm that kind of keeps that in the back of their minds and is, so has, has navigated through that for a lot of women. And I just think it comes with the territory a little bit. And so uh, more than anything, I think I, I, I am preparing for it and trying right. to make sure that we don't do anything that merits a takedown story. But that's, that's sort of part of the process, I think. 
It's sanguine advice. Raquel, did you want to say anything? I wanted to ask another question. Yeah, so I think that media is extremely important, right? Because uh, you want to make sure that you portray your company that is out there everywhere. And you know that's going to help you with partnerships. It's going to help you with hiring. It's going to help you, you know, just going forward in so many ways. Uh, in my case, I got four years of training at Uber. Uh, so definitely, <laughs> I think ground. I got it. Uh, <laughs> so, so you know, that has helped me actually. Uh, I'm, you know, half year. Right, but um, that has helped me a lot uh, in terms of being very cautious, kind of uh, making sure that I'm always on target, on message, etc. Uh, but I definitely recommend a lot that uh, you know for any of you to uh, to invest the time in media and but be selective at the same time and uh, you know make sure that uh, you know is the, the right time for the right thing. And I think as women we have you know a duty which is to showcase that it is possible to fund companies, is it possible to be successful, is it possible to be somebody, you know, very technical in a field that is very male dominated, etc. Um, so I take this as, you know, part of the why I'm doing this in the first place. It's a really good point. Can I say something on this one? Please. Um, I'm definitely going to get canceled. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've already accepted it. It's totally fine. I mean, again, it's, it kind of it begs for it. Um, but I think one thing I've found that has been really helpful that I, I would recommend, I think to, to anybody, but especially women, is actually controlling your own narrative. So I'm really active on Twitter. It's been really helpful. Um, it's been helpful for me personally. It's been helpful for building a team. We've recruited great team members. I think it would have been challenging to recruit. And I also just controlled the narrative of how we talk about our company, how we talk about our science, how we talk about what we're doing. Um, I write a lot of blogs, both about you know the founder journey and just loyal, my thesis, and how I think about things. Um, and I, I think that really helps because at least there is a t very time dated um, first person horse's mouth uh, archive out there of how I think and who I am. And that's been a much bigger driver than honestly any article we've ever done anyhow. That's great. So I know we're running out of time, but all three, all of us were asking this question the other day is all of you said the one thing that made you do what you did was great mentors and allies. Uh, they pushed you, they allowed you to do what you want and continue to do it. So I'd love for you to talk about that. And maybe Nikki, you can start. Yeah, I think from deciding to start a company to every step of fundraising, everything we have ever done, I've had a team of the most exceptional almost all men, but really talented, super successful um, entrepreneurs and executives. Uh, Jeff Wilkie just joined us. He's a former CEO of Amazon, has been alongside Bezos for the last 20 years. Um, as an advisor, he's been the most exceptional step up for our whole company and how we think about everything and about the potential of Homebound and how do we build a trillion dollar business here. And I think every step of the way, we have been so lucky to have people behind us who believed in us, in many cases more than we believe in ourselves or more than I believed in us and showed us what was possible. And so I think as I look out to this audience and think about anybody that's in the ecosystem, every single one of us has the opportunity to be that for someone else. And there aren't that many women or diverse founders. And so it means we need all of the existing founders to grab really high potential, awesome women and diverse founders and support them. Tell them they can do it. When, as you're learning, share what you're learning. The other thing I would say is tell people what's hard. Um, I think one of the things we, we assume men are really confident and that they don't feel imposter syndrome. And I think that's actually patently false and it makes it harder for everyone. And so one of the things I was really lucky to have in the early days were a couple of entrepreneurs who run multi-billion dollar companies who told me it was horrible, that the early days were horrible. It was hard, they failed all the time. They wanted to quit every day. And that's how I felt. It was horrible, I hated it. And I thought something was wrong with me. And I assumed it was because I was a woman and because I was a mom. And actually that was totally false. It's because starting a company is the hardest thing you can ever do. And so being open about that and being willing to share really tough experiences, I think is essential to pulling the whole next generation of entrepreneurs behind us. Thanks. Raquel? Yeah, so for the first 20 years of my career, I didn't really have the chance to have a good mentor. Um, so I learned to the hard way, I guess, the importance of mentors and, uh, you know, to really fight for every single thing. And, you know, I come from a very humble family. You know, I did my undergrad in Spain where, you know, university nobody knows about. So I had to really fight every single battle and that gave me you know, an incredible grit that, you know, I'm unstoppable. I think that's what people t tend to say. Uh, now, in the late days, I guess in the last five years, I have had some great mentors, and in particular, these two that have helped me a lot into uh, who I am today as a CEO and founder of Wabi, which is, you know, Dara 
because Rosagi, which I can pronounce his family name, uh, <laughs> is the CEO of Uber as well as Leo Ron, which uh, is the, I guess, head of Uber Freight. Uh, both have been incredible in, you know, in really helping me to understand, you know, not just the technical side, which is my thing, right, but, uh, you know, what it means to be a founder, what it means to be, um, uh, you know, somebody in business. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been incredible. Um, and, you know, thanks to, to them, I think, you know, I'm here today. Uh, uh, talking to you guys, so I think that you know it's incredible the opportunity that it, everybody has in terms of you know making a difference for many people. Yeah, I think for me, um, I would echo everything you guys have said. Obviously, um, I think I think I think the the two things I would say is the importance of um, ca uh, catalysts and people who tell you can do it. Um, both those who like are similar to you, like Laura played a huge role for that in, in me, like a binary role for that on me. Um, but there's also uh, a Greg Rosen, a VC at Box Group, actually convinced me to start Loyal. And if you know me now, I'm like, I literally, I, I live and breed, breathe, oh my God, um, Loyal and everything we're doing. And I'm, I'm extremely, extremely passionate about it, but he actually almost had to convince me to start the company. And it wasn't because I didn't want to start the company. It was because I just like never, ever in a million years ever saw myself as a CEO. It, it was, I did not. I didn't have a lemonade stand. Like, it was just, like, not, it, it just wasn't even, like, a scope of possibility in my head, right? I thought it was, like, doctor, lawyer, or, you know, whatever, businessman, but, uh, you know. And so I think the that was hugely impactful to just over and over and over again, somebody who was already there and already achieved the thing, saying that, you know, he thought I was great. He thought, he, you know, I was talented. He thought I could do it. That was hugely impactful and then the the other kind of general category of you know impact people have had is you know bringing you into rooms where it's you're, you're not going to get there ourselves right like it, it is hard you don't get invited to the like the, the cocktail beer drinks whatever to chat and rub shoulders which is a where a lot of things happen um especially in tech um but i've had a couple of allies who will just bring me anyhow and who will you know advocate for me be like celine's cool and she can hang um, and that is so valuable because it's such a huge activation energy to get into those rooms on your own when it's somebody else's, you know, a small lift can make actually a huge difference. That's great. So we have to wrap up the panel, but before we go, I wanted to thank you all. I also wanted to say we had had this conversation in the back room and we thought, why don't we put out an idea to everybody out here that maybe in the next year, as Nikki was talking about and Raquel and Celine, Try and think of one or two things you could do to bring women to the forefront. And maybe if Vinod and Samir will let us do it, we'll actually ask you when you come back to Summit next year. So with that, I wanted to thank you all for being here. We will now take a break and you will be, oh, we are skipping break. I <laughs> see on the prompter and from David Vaca. We're gonna skip break and we're going to go and do woolly mammoths. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Vinod. Thank so you.